Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Franz. I'm a museum educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual programming here. Uh, then this Friday, I'm here with my colleague, Alicia. She's going to be in the comments. So if you all would like to let us know where you're tuning in from, um, we love to know where you're tuning in from. Also, if you let us know if you've ever visited the Intrepid in person or virtually, we'd like to know that as well to see where everyone's uh, uh, knowledge is at the beginning of the program. So let us know in the comments section. Um, we are starting to do lots of different cool virtual programs. If you are interested in uh, joining us uh, for these programs, you can find out more information at intrepidmuseum.org. Now throughout the entire uh, the entirety of the program, if you have any questions at any time, feel free to let us know in the comments and myself or Alicia will keep an eye on it to make sure that we can answer it, okay? So let's start our uh, uh, little mission, a little adventure today. Now, in order for me to talk about the Intrepid, uh, as you guys can tell, I am in my uh, my home. But in order for us to talk about the Intrepid, we have to go to the Intrepid. So we're going to do that kind of virtually today by looking at a video, right? And here at the Intrepid, um, when you come to the Intrepid, one of the first things you will see, one of the first things you're greeted by is this amazing model of the ship that the museum is, right? And this is a model of the Intrepid made entirely out of, you guys can let me know in the comments if you wanna take a guess what it's made out of, right? But this is a large model of the Intrepid to talk about how uh, large the Intrepid truly is, right? The Intrepid is 913 feet long. It's about three football fields long, right? The length of the Intrepid and the width of the Intrepid is massive, right? And right now, the Intrepid is in the Hudson River in New York City. Now, the ship was made back in 1943. It served in three wars, World War II, Vietnam, and the Cold War. But in uh, 1982, it was retired, no longer used for the military service. And in 1974, we became, sorry, in 1974, it was retired. In 1982, we became the Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum, right? Now, if you guess that this model was made out of Legos, you'd be 100% right. This is made entirely out of Legos. 250,000 Lego pieces make up this Lego uh, model of the Intrepid. Now, what we're going to do is kind of talk about some things that you kind of can see on the top there besides the planes, right? We are going to be talking about the people who lived on the ship, right? Because not only did people live on the ship, they also worked on the ship. So we're going to be talking about what it was like to live and work on an aircraft carrier like Intrepid. Now, the way that we're going to do this is the way, this is the kind of the way that I think of it. If you can think about the sport of soccer, maybe you play soccer, maybe you like to watch soccer. But if you think about uh, the, the sport of soccer, you might be able to think about the uniforms that the soccer players wear, right? And you might think that all the uh, the uniforms that the soccer players wear are kind of look the same, look the same, right? But there's one player on that soccer team who wears a different uniform, right? And this person is the goalie, right? And the goalie wears a slightly different uniform than everyone else, because the goalie has a different job than everyone else, right? And so that's what we're going to be talking about throughout the program today. We're going to be talking about the different jobs that these sailors had and the clothes that would show you that these jobs uh, were done by these particular sailors, right? Now, in the comments, you all can start, uh, we can start this uh, adventure by you all letting me know some jobs that you remember or some jobs that you can think of from your community, right? And this can be any job anywhere in your community. I want you to think about that and let us know what jobs you can think of and put them in the comments, okay? And we're gonna see if some of those jobs would have taken place or would have happened here on Intrepid, right? Now, what we're walking through now is uh, a place called the hangar deck or the hangar level. And in this level, there's lots of really interesting things. And the first thing I wanna take you to is this area here. And I'm bringing you here because this is the first uh, place of uh, the jobs that we're going to be talking about, okay? Now, what we're looking at here, this door actually opens up and it reveals an elevator. But this elevator is actually not for people, right? This elevator is not for supplies like we would think. This elevator specifically 
is for bombs, right? So this is the bomb elevator, one of the bomb elevators on Intrepid, right? Now, if you can think about bombs, bombs usually go alongside with fire, right? So you all can let me know in the comments what color you think individuals who were the bomb op elevator operators and the ordnance people, people that uh, handle the things that went boom, you guys can let me know what colors you think they wore, what color you think they wore. And to give you another hint, since I said it before, had something to do with fire, think about individuals who put fires out in our community, right? You probably have an idea right now of what color these sailors would have wear worn, and these sailors would have worn red shirts, right? They were known as the ordnance people, and they would wear red shirts. And this is done on purpose, right? Because red is a highly visible color, right? It's really vibrant. It's really easy to see. So you're going to want want these individuals to wear uh, red so that everyone can kind of steer clear of them if they're doing something very important, right? I see some folks in the comments got red shirts. Good job. Also, throughout the program, I want you all to make note of what color shirt you're wearing, because then that's probably the job you would have on the Intrepid since you're wearing that color shirt, right? So let's continue. Now, right next to the bomb elevator over here, we have a very interesting um, exhibit, right? And we call this our chair exhibit. When I first started working at the Intrepid, they told us that we had a chair exhibit, and I thought that sounded like the most boring thing in the world, right? Now, if we look here, though, we'll see that some of these chairs are a little bit more interesting. Now, this first chair, got to talk about the elephant in the room, right? This boring looking chair. It's a green chair here. What do we think that this chair is used for? You can let us know in the comments, right? But this chair looks like a chair that we all sit on, right? It looks like a normal chair, right? And as a matter of fact, this chair is known as the Navy side chair. And it's known as a Navy side chair because it was the most common chair used in the Navy, right? Chair for anyone to sit on. And this chair tells us something about jobs at the Intrepid. It tells us that people had regular jobs where you just needed to sit, right? And these jobs include people who sign the checks, people who sort the mail, right? All of these individuals need office space, kind of like how we have office spaces in our community, right? So this chair would be used for that, right? Now, if we kind of look over to the left of the Navy side chair, we'll see some of the more interesting chairs that would have been aboard the Intrepid. Like the chair directly next to this one actually happens to be an ejection seat. I think we kind of go over this one pretty quickly in this video, but you can kind of see it there. We kind of rewind it a bit. You might be able to kind of catch a glimpse of it there. That is the ejection seat or ejection seat that was used in an airplane that would save pilots lives, right? But speaking of pilots, next to uh, those pilot chairs, we have this chair here that pilots would sit in all the same. Now, if we look at this chair, you might think that this chair was used for a specific job. You all can let me know in the comments which were, what you think this uh, chair was used for. A lot of individuals who see this, they think barber chair, right? Kind of put your head back, kind of get your hair done. And I will say this, that on Intrepid, there were barbers. So that's not a bad guess. But this chair is a little bit different. This chair has all to do with the pearly whites that you have, right? This is a dentist chair. And this chair was used by dentists aboard the Intrepid. I guess maybe some people are a little confused by that. There were dentists aboard the Intrepid, right? And this tells us something very important. We should probably go to the dentist every six months, once every six months, right? So this tells us that the fact that they needed a dentist, that they thought that that was so important, tells us that, these sailors would probably have been at the Intrepid for about six to eight months, right? Which is a long time to be away from friends and family. Now, right next to that, to the right, we have kind of some brown looking chairs that we're gonna see in a second. And these brown looking chairs look very comfortable. Some people say they look like movie theater seats, right? Some people also say that they kind of look like uh, chairs that might be used in like first cabin of a plane or a train, right? But these chairs here have another function. And we'll talk more specifically about the function of these chairs in a little bit, because that's not where they would be here on the Intrepid, right? But shifting gears a bit, now it's time to look 
at our first airplane here at the museum. My favorite airplane, this is the Avenger airplane, right? It's the oldest airplane in our collection from World War II, right? Now, if we look at the Avenger, we can see that it is massive, right? It is gigantic. There's even another plane right in the back there known as the Fury. That plane is also pretty big with really big wings, right? And so in this whole entire area, we would have planes stored, right? And during World War II, the Intrepid could have about 100 airplanes on it, right? Which is a lot of airplanes. Now, we don't want these planes to stay in this area. We want to get them upstairs, right? So can anyone in the comment section let me know what we're going to use to get these planes upstairs, right? What are we going to, how are we going to get the planes from inside of the, uh, the aircraft carrier, right? How are we going to get the planes from inside up to the flight deck and all ready to take off, right? What are we going to use? Now, if you said stairs, planes can't really use stairs, right? But if you said an elevator, you'd be correct. They actually had an elevator. They would move these gates out of the way. They'd push the elevator out onto the aircraft elevator, right, uh, outside of here. They would, excuse me, they would push the plane out into the aircraft elevator. And then the aircraft elevator would take the plane upstairs. Now, the individuals who operated the aircraft elevator, they were known as the blue shirts, as this you can see this gentleman here, right? Their job was to make sure that the planes were moving in the right way. And that's even be this between the decks and also uh, along the flight deck as well. If you can tell by my shirt, that's probably what I would be if I was on Intrepid right now. I'd be a blue shirt operating the elevator. Now, right behind the Avenger, as I said before, we have a fast jet plane called the Fury. And the Fury was used during uh, the Cold War, right? Now, the Fury is a really good example of a plane down here because you can see the Fury looks very, very nice and clean, right? Here at the Intrepid, we have a dedicated air, aircraft restoration team that takes care uh, takes care of the planes that we have here. They make them look really nice. They paint them and, and all that jazz, right? During when the Intrepid was in service, they would have plane handlers do this as well, right? And sometimes we might think of pilots as owning planes, but if you ask any pilot in the Navy, they will tell you that they were borrowing, borrowing, excuse me, the planes from the plane handlers. Why? Because the plane handlers knew the ins and outs of the planes. They spent the most intimate time with these planes, making sure they were in tip top shape for the pilots to take off in, right? And so the plane handlers who would have taken care of these planes, they were known as the brown shirts, as you can see this individual here, carefully wiping down uh, the top part of the airplane. So this is kind of equivalent to someone who cleans, right? This would be like a cleaner, right? But specifically for planes, right? Making sure that the plane is in tip top shape. Now, while the plane handler is doing that, we have to make sure that these planes can fly and that they can go, right? So how are we going to make sure that these planes can fly and how are we going to make sure that they can go? Well, we're going to need fuel, right? And so there were different fueling stations aboard the Intrepid just to get the fuel to the planes as they needed it. And one of these stations is actually right here uh, in the hangar level, right where you see all of this green, uh, excuse me, this gray and purple uh, action going on here. And actually this purple kind of uh, pipe here is very significant because the individuals who fueled up the planes, their nicknames or their names were the purple shirts, right? They had purple shirts. Now they did have a nickname, a very clever nickname. And I'll let you all try to guess it in the comments, what they call people who wore purple shirts above, aboard an aircraft carrier. And to give you a hint, shares their, they share their name with a very, very popular fruit. Let's see if you all can get that in the comments. Now, a little bit farther down, now it's time to talk a little bit more about those pilots, right? We talked about the planes that they'd be flying in and who would be helping them out with these planes, right? But now it's time to talk a little bit more about the pilots. So what we're looking at here is a pilot's case exhibit at the Intrepid. And this exhibit uh, shows you some of the things that pilots would have on their persons while they were actually flying. So the first thing we see here is a canvas suit, a jumpsuit here. Doesn't look too uh, uh, 
substantial, right? It looks very thin. Looks like it might be kind of cold to wear that. But this is kind of the uniform that the pilots would have to wear. Also, right next to that, you see this helmet, right? And this helmet is a very interesting pilot's helmet. It would fit right on the pilot's head. But if you look on the side, we have this thing in the ear, which represents a radio, right? So this is how they're going to be able to communicate using a radio right there in their ear. Okay. Now, it also had a chin strap to attach to your chin. This here is very important as well. This is what we call a life vest. Now, why are life vests important for pilots? Well, sometimes pilots had to bail out of their planes. They had to climb out onto the wing and jump off, or they used that ejection seat to get out of their plane, right? Then they have a parachute that comes out, and they start floating slowly down, right? Now, if you're a pilot for the Navy, nine times out of 10, you're probably going to be flying over the water sometime. So that probably ended up happening. You, uh, your parachute kind of drops you to, off into the water. Now, sometimes the Intrepid wasn't around to pick you up. So while you were waiting there, you couldn't just swim, right? All the time you get too tired. So we're going to have this life vest around us, right? What the pilots are going to do is they're going to pull on the black and these black uh, little strings there at the bottom. There's air canisters and it causes the vest to inflate immediately, right? If that didn't work, you have to blow in on these black tubes here and blow it up like a balloon, which would take a lot more effort, right? Now, there's a couple other really important things in this case that a pilot would uh, would have on their persons, right? Now, if you look here, you can see this is a kind of a small little handheld thing. It has a string wrapped around it. But if you look closely in the middle, you might be able to see my eye, right? And the reason why you can see my eye is because this is an actual mirror, right? Now, if you've ever been in a car on a hot summer day and ever uh, had the, or any bright sunny day, and took the seatbelt and took the uh, the mirror kind of thing as part of the seatbelt and shined it into the sun, you can actually see the reflection kind of in the car. You can move it and you can point it to wherever you want. That's what the pilots uh, were attempting to do with this, right? They would use this. They would point it up at the sky, right? There was a crosshair. You can actually kind of see it if you look really closely there's a crosshair in the middle of this that's shaped like the letter t that you can kind of look through and you can pinpoint where you want to uh, angle that light you can flash it at an as at a passing by helicopter or plane so that way you could potentially be saved right now next to this though we have this kind of piece of paper here right now if we look at it we can see some things that might be noticeable, like the American flag, right? But you might look a little closer. Here, I'll zoom in a bit. You might look a little closer, and you see that there are words written here. And a lot of these words aren't English characters, right, that we, that we can think of, right? These are other countries' uh, languages, right? And so when we look at this, if you can read one of these languages or two of these languages, you might be able to figure out that these messages say the same exact thing, right? This is before Google Translate, ladies and gentlemen. This is how a pilot's going to communicate with someone if they saved them and they didn't know who they were and they didn't speak the same language. You see, this message on here says it in various languages. It says, uh, I'm a, a, an aviator from the United States Navy. Please take me in and treat me well and my country will reward you, right? And this was important just in case the pilot got found by someone uh, who was speaking a certain language. Now, you might be wondering why there are only these languages. It's because of where the pilot would be flying, right? And depending on where the pilot was flying, they used the languages um, of the, the most common languages spoken in that region, right? So on this one, we can see French, um, we can see some Mandarin, we can see lots of different things here, right? Now, Pilots were super important, um, and so as we're going to see here, we're going to see one of the uh, the most famous pilot on Intrepid, Mr. Alex Ferreshu, who was a an Intrepid aviator during World War II. I um, mean, I believe on this picture he is actually on top of an Avenger, if I'm not mistaken, or a Hellcat. Right, and there he is smiling with all of his gear on, his helmet, his life vest, his jumpsuit, right, ready to go. Now. 
that's us talking about pilots. Now we're going to move on. But before we move on, I'm going to see if there's any questions that I can answer um, from anybody in the chat and questions that you guys have. Feel free to type them into the comment section. So how many people were on Intrepid? Thank you. Oh, that's a really good question. So there uh, were 3,200 sailors aboard the Intrepid. Um, when the Intrepid was in service, um, there were no women allowed on the, the military ship. Um, as of today, though, um, there are women allowed on military ships, which is a great advancement in the military. But at that time period, it would have only been 3,200 men aboard the Intrepid. What was the white chair on the end used for? Okay, so let me go back to our video here. And I'm actually going to jump back to this, uh, to their, a little bit of our chair exhibit here and see if we can see this white chair here on the end. So this chair here is actually known as the Highline chair. And this chair was used almost like a zip line. If you can think of how a zip line works, you go from one end to the other. That's what the chair was used for. It would actually connect between two different ships. And if you were a down pilot and you got picked up by a ship that wasn't intrepid, you would actually sit on that chair and you could be moved and ferried from one ship to another. Um, this also was done with um, supplies as well on this. So it just pretty much acts as, as a way to transport things from one ship to another. Great questions. So let's move up. Oh, that's a great question. So what do the stickers mean on the side of the plane? Yeah, make reference to that. Thank you so much. So if we go back to our picture here of Mr. Alex Ferreshu, we can see that on his plane, see if we can get it here. On his plane here, you might notice there's some stickers on the side. Some of these are just uh, just things to, just to add his character to the plane. But if you look here, these uh, stickers here are actually uh, flags and they represent planes that he actually shot down. Um, and when you shot down a certain amount of planes, you were known as an ace. So he was a, uh, an intrepid ace pilot, right? It's a great question. So let's move on a bit. Let's go, because we just talked about pilots. So now we're gonna move actually from this area of the ship to a place that I really like, right? Now, ladies and gentlemen, if we look here, we can see this, you can let me know in the comment what this looks like, right? This, though, is a gigantic cake. It's not real. I wish it was. But to show you what the real cake looked like or what one of these real cakes looked like, it looked like this. Look at this. This is absurdly huge, right? And this is for Intrepid's first anniversary. It wasn't like it was for like its 75th anniversary. It was for its first anniversary. And this gigantic cake was built. So we're going to go downstairs and see where these sailors would have eaten. Right? And, and we talk a little bit about cooking. Now, this area here is known as the mess deck, right? Or third deck. This is um, kind of toward the bottom, the end, the bottom part of the ship. Uh, now, down here, there's a machine shop. So you had individuals uh, doing um, uh, metal work down here. As you're going to see here, this, this gentleman here on a Navy aircraft carrier doing metal work. Now, a little bit farther down, though, we'll have where all of the food was made on Intrepid, right? Now, we may call these places kitchens, and we're going to see some things that do resemble kitchens or, or, or things in kitchens, but we'll also see some things that we probably wouldn't see at home, right? So if we look here, we can see these gigantic vats in the back here. Oof, I would don't have that in my kitchen, although I kind of wish I did. These kitchens were so much different than kitchens at our house that they had a different name. We call kitchens on ships galleys, right? So this is the galley. Right. And there would have been lots of different cooks, um, chefs in this area as well. So you can see some individuals cooking here. All right. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about is the sheer amount of food that they were going to be making. If you can recall, I said there was three thousand two hundred sailors aboard the Intrepid. Right. So this is just giving you an idea of how much food they really had to make. Right. So this was back in 1961. The Intrepid is going to Virginia. Right. And it's uh, dishing out 7,500 meals a day for 15 hours. Right. That's seven tons of food per day. And then after 211 days, 1.5, uh, 58 uh, million meals uh, later, the Intrepid, the Intrepid goes back uh, over, goes back to Virginia. Excuse me. It was going to the Mediterranean Sea. Um, so you can see here how much food 
the Intrepid could hold, it can hold enough food that can hold people over for 211 days, but that's still a lot of food, right? A lot of seven tons of food per day, right? And to give put that in a little bit more in perspective, we're talking about uh, recipes that we might make for people at our house, right? Let's go over here and look at a recipe card, a blown up recipe card that you would use if you were working in the galley, right? Now, if we look here, one thing I really want to point out is how many peaches, canned sliced peaches. If you look there, 27 pounds of peaches. That is a lot of peaches, ladies and gentlemen. But the, the craziest thing about this is look how much this, uh, this portion size is. This is for 100 people. And that's for one portion for 100 people. So in order to have everybody on Intrepid or a good amount of everybody on Intrepid eat this, you'd have to multiply this recipe by 30, which is insane, right? Over 600 pounds of peaches, which is a lot of peaches, right? Now, this is where you would cook. What do you think they eat? Where did you think they eat, right? They eat down here as well. And they eat it, they call this the mess deck for obvious reasons, right? This is where you're gonna make a mess, right? But I'm gonna show you a little bit of where these sailors would have eaten and kind of how they would have spiced it up a bit. So we can see here coffee stations, so and they would have coffee, as much coffee as you can drink on the Intrepid. And then in this area, we can see that it looks like a cafeteria, but there's some things that look a little weird, right? Like for instance, this wanted sign and things that look like it would be in the Western. If we look on the other side, right here on this pole, you can see there's a saddle. Do you guys think they had it, horses on Intrepid? No, they didn't have horses, right? So why do we have all of this? Well, it's probably for the idea that you might be thinking of at home, right? If we look at what the mess deck kind of looked like a long time ago, it looked very, very bland, right? Not too much spice to it, not too much color to it, right? But if we look at the mess deck right behind this one, we can see that it has color, it has really cool looking things. They did this so the mess deck can be enjoyable, an enjoyable space for the sailors to eat, a home away from home, a place that they could boost their morale and feel better about being on a ship. I once asked uh, a Marine uh, what was his favorite part about being on a Navy ship, and his answer was getting off of the ship. So you can tell that being on a ship is not the the most glamorous thing, but if you can make it better by uh, putting different colors and putting different things on your wall, why not, right? And that's what they did in the military. Um, in more uh, recent times, they've added things like entertainment systems, like television and video games. So they can actually have a lot more downtime and enjoy themselves more when they're eating. All right, and so here's some other um, rooms or some other eating spaces here on Intrepid, right? So that's eating on Intrepid, which is look pretty cool, right? Look pretty self-explanatory. Now it's time to go to one of the most confusing looking places on the ship. Well, they call this place the brains of the operation, right? We are walking into what we call CIC or the Combat Information Center. This area is housed in what we call the island, which is the really tall structure that stands up on the side of the Intrepid, right? And this area is where you're going to get a lot of your communications, a lot of your radar navigations and radar operation and uh, radio communication here in this area. So you can see these individuals plotting, doing very, very intricate things with all of these instruments like radars and um uh, telegraphs and all of this stuff. So this is where they're getting their information about uh, who they're fighting, what they're seeing, and what's ahead of them, right? This is, as I said before, the brains of the entire ship, right? So you have to be very skilled to work in this area. Now, another uh, area of the ship that this place would be highly influential on is on the flight deck. And this room is very uh, influential to those people who would be flying those planes off the flight deck. This is called the pilot ready room. And if you can recall from those uh, chairs that we saw a little bit ago, this is where those chairs would be in the pilot ready room. This room is simply 
for pilots to get ready for their mission, right? It's where they would gather before missions. They would get information from their uh, squadron leader right here at the uh, at the podium here. They would all be looking up. They, uh, you can see on the walls there. You can see some of their flight suits, some of their uh, the helmets, right? Some of their gear, right? Another thing you see kind of in the middle of the room. Um, if you're younger, you might not know exactly what that is, but that is a projector, and that's something that they use to watch movies and also watch something else that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So what did it look like in this room? Well, during uh, while this the museum was in service, you can see here, this is what a regular pilot ready room would look like. You can see these individuals looking kind of in the front. They're probably listening to someone speak, but you can see it's where they would hang out, right? And this one looks a little bit better than what we're going to see next, a more modern uh, uh, pilot ready room. And you'll see why. Um, you'll see why this is more like a classroom for some people. As you can see here, these individuals have their desk out. They also are taking notes. Um, there's also an individual kind of in the middle of the room who doesn't look like they want to be there. So it's just like a regular old classroom, right? You have students of all, of all shapes and sizes, right? So now we're gonna go and look so we just talked about another job, right? We talked about working in the CIC and being a pilot, seeing all these fancy rooms and all these fancy knobs. So now it's time to go see where they slept, right? Because a lot of people, when they come to the Intrepid, they're shocked to find out that not only did 3,200 uh, men serve here, they also lived on Intrepid, right? They also slept on Intrepid. So let's go check out some of those bedrooms now. now in order for us to do this, we have to take a bit of a trip to what we call the forecastle or the forecastle of the ship, right? And so for us to do this, we are here now, right? So this is the front nose of the ship, right? And here we can see there's uh, bathrooms, right? These aren't the only bathrooms that would be on the ship, but these are some of the bathrooms. You can see they're regular bathrooms. But what we can do at uh, museums like the Intrepid is we uh, sometimes wanna make it easier to get around. So what we did was we added these stairs. Right, these stairs that I'm walking up here in the video. And these stairs actually go up and inside of a room that used to be on Intrepid in this area. Now, where we are right now is known as officer country, right? This is where officers would sleep on, or one of the places that officers would sleep on Intrepid. Now, what makes this so interesting? Well, these officers specifically were pilots. And as we can see in this room, they had bunk beds, they had a dresser, right? And if we look very closely, we can see they had amenities like an air conditioning unit or a fan, right? Now, the pilots who would live in uh, this room, uh, they once said that uh, during the hot months in uh, Vietnam, they said that the temperature would get high, uh, as high as 110 degrees. But with the AC blowing, it would get a nice and comfortable and cool 95, which is still extremely hot. So take that for what you will, right? Now, this is one area. What I'm going to do is show you all a second area. And I want to see which one would you all like rather sleep in, right? So this area here, we'll think of this area that we're looking at as area one. Okay, so you can write number one in the comments if you'd like to live here. And then when I show you the second area, right up the stairs here, I want you to write two if you'd rather sleep in that area. So once again, this area that we're looking at here, area one. And as we go up these stairs, this area will be area two. So remember, you can write number one for area one or two for this area here. So this area, as we can look around, we can see bunk beds, but these bunk beds look a little bit different than the one that we saw downstairs, right? We can also see um, kind of like a cabinet storage space in the back, right? And I'm seeing some answers in the comments for number one, seeing folks saying that they would rather sleep in number one. Um, and I would agree, and this is why I would agree. One, those bed bunk, those bunks that we see, those bunk beds, they actually would be probably moving because they're on chains, right? Then they don't look too sturdy. Also, if you look in the back there, you see that gray locker there. There's a cutout of one of the front of the lockers there. And you can see that it's separated into six compartments. You got one of those compartments in this space, right? So you don't get a lot of space. Um, the chains are swinging all over the place. This area is known as marine berthing. 
not birthing like giving birth, right? This is birthing spelled B-E-R-T-H-I-N-G. And birthing is just another word for sleeping area, right? So this is where the Marines would sleep, right? And uh, another thing I wanna show you um, is in this area, right above where you would be sleeping, there's uh, something that's very important to the ship, but also very loud. You wouldn't wanna sleep underneath it, right? As uh, you can see here, how cramped this space is. Now, the reason why the living spaces, <clears throat> excuse me, look a little different is because uh, it's almost like if you have an older brother, like I have, and growing up, my older brother and older sister had bigger rooms than I did. <coughs> excuse me. And why did they have bigger rooms? Because they were older, right? Here in the military and Navy, the higher up in rank you, you are, the better your living accommodations. So that's why these living accommodations look so different. Now, this here is what we call the steam catapult. We'll talk about that more as we go outside, all right? So this is right abo above our heads on the flight deck. So what we're going to do is leave out this area and go check out the flight deck. But before we do that, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to see if there are any questions before we go upstairs. Any questions at all? Any questions about any of the planes that we saw, any of the... So how many aircraft elevators did the Intrepid have? Great question. So the air, uh, the Intrepid actually had three. It had one on either side. Now on a ship, if you wanna say left and right, you don't really say left and right. You say port and starboard. Port is left because there's four letters in port. So port is left and starboard is right. So on the port and starboard side, there are two, there are elevators on either side, uh, one we still use. And uh, in the middle of the front of the ship, right? It literally would drop into the floor, you can put airplanes on it, and then it'll go back up. But today, that's a um, today is a theater at the museum. Right. Uh, could the sailors bring anything with them on the ship? That's a great question. So the sailors could bring things, but they had to be very, very careful with what they bring. What they couldn't bring, like for instance, today sailors can't bring, you know. Uh, their PlayStations, um, you know, they can't bring, you know, any desk. Uh, they can't bring like all the pillows and, 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 and sheets that they want. They have to bring a certain amount of things because all of that extra stuff adds weight to the ship. And you don't want to add too much weight to the ship. So they can bring stuff with them, but they have a limited, uh, they have limited stuff that they can bring. Um, so I think this Okay. Okay. So uh, are Avengers still flown in the Navy today? It's a great question. So the first plane that we saw, that big blue plane, that's the Avenger. That plane does not fly in the Navy anymore. Um, it's a little bit obsolete and old, but now we have uh, planes that are a lot faster, but we still do use planes like that. And actually the Avenger was used uh, for several years as a, uh, a fire, uh, kind of like to fight fires instead of dropping a torpedo or drop water. And it also was used to water crops. So, all right, so now we will jump to outside, guys. So right outside this area is this place that we call the gun tub, but we're gonna skip through that and go right up to the flight deck, right? So this is where all that action happened, planes taking off and landing. A lot of these planes would have taken off from Intrepid, some of them would never. But what's very interesting about that is even though the Intrepid's long, if you've ever been to a aircraft, excuse me, an airport, you would know that the airports have long runways. In this one, you only have about 300 feet to take off. So how are you going to take off safely on the Intrepid? Are you going to build up enough speed? Well, you're going to use this. This thing here is known as a steam catapult. And steam catapults pretty much act like slingshots. They attach to the bottom of airplanes and they pretty much shoot the planes off from 160, mile, 160 miles per hour, excuse me, to uh, zero uh, miles per hour to 160 in just two seconds, right? So it's very, very efficient to building up speed um, with not a lot of runway space. Now, because the Intrepid isn't long enough for planes to take off uh, without any help, it's also not long enough for these planes to land without any help. So what are they gonna use? Well, right here on the, uh, by the way, on the Cougar, we can see exactly where you would actually attach to get the uh, steam catapult to take off right here, this yellow hook at the bottom. But right next to the Cougar, we have a very interesting looking plane known as the Tracer. Its nickname is the Hamburger because of that big radar dish at the top, right? 
But if we go to the back tail part of the uh, tracer, we see something very interesting. We see a hook. And if you look there, you can see a black and white hook that comes off of the tail of the tracer. And this black and white hook is a tail hook. Tail hooks drop and catch a cable so that the plane could stop. So when the plane comes in for a landing, it comes on all four of those wheels, and then it drops that tail hook to catch onto that cable to slow it down from 160 miles per hour to zero in just two seconds. Now, all of this is an intricate song and dance, right? Getting planes to take off and getting them to land. So you're going to need people who are in charge of that. So who's going to be in charge of that? Well, they're going to be the green shirts, right? The green shirts are going to be the ones that handle the arrestor cables, that handle the steam catapults and make sure that they're working appropriately. One thing that I like to look uh, point out about this picture is if you look at this individual as they're working on the steam catapult, there is a jet going full speed behind their head, which seems like it would be extremely scary. You can let me know in the comments if you'd be scared, because I would. Now, if you can recall, when we we're talking about the pilot's ready room, there was a, 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 a projector in that room. And I said that that projector was for watching movies, but it was also for doing something else very important. You see, when these planes were taking off and landing, sometimes there would be errors, right? And we wanted to know how to fix these errors. So what's the best way to do that? Well, we're going to record our landings and taking and our takeoffs, right? And we're going to watch them, almost like sport, sport athletes watch game film to figure out what they can do better for the next game, right? That's what they were doing with this, right? And these were the white shirts. They were the safety, uh, 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 the safety sailors on Intrepid. And they would make sure that the pl planes and pilots took off and landed safely by recording things uh, often from the aircraft carrier. Now, here comes my favorite shirt. If I could have a yellow Intrepid shirt, I would wear it because the yellow shirts have a very important job. And you might have seen this job. This is probably one of the most celebrated jobs on an aircraft carrier. When these planes are taking off and landing right aboard the Intrepid here on the flight deck, we can see, as we can see in this image and the other image, planes are taking off near their heads. It is extremely loud on the flight deck. Sometimes it's too loud so loud that you can't hear around you. So you have to use hand signals in order to, uh, to tell planes how to move, right? How to maneuver. And this is our yellow shirt, right? This is our yellow shirt. Our yellow shirt is going to be on the flight deck as a landing signal officer. So just for fun, we can try this out. I want you all to try this out at home. You can try to do some landing signal officer hand signs with me, right? So this is how we're gonna do it. The first thing we're gonna do is tell a plane to follow us, right? Because if we're on a flight deck and we need this plane to follow, actually, the first thing we need to do is tell the plane to remove their tie downs. Now, a tie down is a chain that's uh, attached to part of the flight deck that doesn't allow the plane to move, right? So the way that you tell a plane to, uh, to get rid of its tie downs, and that means the, the, the plane handlers will take them off, is to take your arm, your hand, and gently wipe off your shoulder like this, both shoulders like that. This means remove the chains, right? Now you want your plane to follow you, right? This is how you tell a plane to follow you. You put your two palms up toward the screen so you can see your palms if you, if you have a camera on. If not, just put your palms up and you push your hands forward. You turn your hands and you pull them back and you do this while you're moving, right? And so this way you can tell a plane exactly which way you want them to move, right? So you just keep doing this. Now, let's say that your plane's moving way too fast. You need it to slow down. You take your palms, you point them toward the floor, and you act like you're dribbling a basketball. This is the double dribble sign in basketball, so that's why I really like this one, because I like basketball. But if you do this, this tells a plane to slow down. So the plane starts to slow down. Now you need the plane to stop, because it's in the right position. You take your hand, put it in a diamond, put it above your head, like this. And that's how you tell a plane to stop. Now we have to get the plane to turn on its engines. So you take your two fingers, you go like this, and this tells a plane to start its engines. Not like this, but like this, right? This tells a plane to start its engines. And then if you want to tell a plane to take off, you take those two fingers, you point them to the floor, and then you shoot up right when you're ready for the plane to take off. Just like we see the yellow shirt doing here, telling the plane next to it to shoot off, and it's okay for it to take off from the flight deck. 
Now, even with taking off, we need to also direct it. This is like, the, so the yellow shirt's like the conductor, right? And the yellow shirt's also conducting um, helicopters and planes, how it's gonna land. Getting information from the CIC and the island that we just saw. As you can see, this yellow shirt is actually telling this uh, helicopter that it needs to move more to the right, right? It's hi He's hiding his hand because he has to put his hand in his back so that he doesn't confuse the pilot by using his left hand, right? So he's hiding his left hand to say, only go right, only focus on right, right? And so all of these, this job and all the rest of these jobs that we talked about, we can see how important they are in order for the ship to, to function, right? Now, up here also, right over here, um, if you were wondering what that aircraft elevator looks like, it doesn't look like the elevator that we normally use in buildings, right? It's made out of teak wood because teak wood is really easy to replace and um, to repair if they needed it to. And actually the whole entire flight deck at the top part of the ship would have used, it used to be made out of wood. We've since put metal on it because we have a lot of visitors and we don't want that wood to splinter, right? But as I said before, all of these jobs, all of these sailors, all uh, function as a city at sea. Right? All of these people have different jobs and these jobs work in concert with one another. Right? And if you look at this image, this is a very great image of all the different colored shirts and all the different jobs that they would have on Intrepid. Because of all the different colors of all the different shirts of the Navy, these individuals had the nickname of, uh, they shared a nickname with a famous uh, candy. You guys can write that in the comments. Also, if you guys were wondering what the answer was before for the purple shirts, their nicknames were grapes, right? They were nicknamed grapes. And when you put all of them together, you kind of get like a bag of Skittles. So they're called the Skittles, which I think is a cool and appropriate name for these sailors, right? So ladies and gentlemen, that was a brief kind of tour of uh, and a little bit of the history of the Intrepid. So I wanna open the floor up to answer a couple of questions before we end our program today. So let's see if there's any more. So what happens if a plane misses the landing cable? So talking about the, uh, the, uh, the tail hook and the tail hook catching the cable. Um, a long time ago, they had what's called uh, this crash wall. And this crash wall will come up when, if a plane uh, needed to slow down. Right. This is actually before the arrestor cables and the planes kind of crashed into this crash wall, which wasn't safe. So then they added the arrestor cables so that the, the planes can catch those cables. But as we could see, you could probably miss those. Right. If you're not perfect with this landing, you could possibly miss it. So to alleviate that, they did five of them across the flight deck. Now, if you miss all five of those, what will happen? Well, because the uh, the Intrepid in later years was angled, right? So instead of being like this, the Intrepid kind of had this part that came off of the side like this, and you would actually speed up and then take off from the side of the ship, come around and land again. If that didn't work, you'd have to try it again, take off and come back and land. If that didn't work, you'd try it again, come back and land it. But by then, you weren't seen as a great aviator because a great aviator could catch it on the first or second track. And so then you lost your pilot's license, which isn't good. So don't do that. Any other questions? How many planes do you have at the museum now? So uh, I believe it's about 26 planes, 28 planes. I always forget the, the exact number. Maybe Alicia could tell me the exact number. I think it's 26. But um, we also have a space shuttle. We also have some of the fastest jets ever built. We have 28. Alicia told me we have 28, excuse me. Um, 28 aircraft in this helicopters and airplanes. And we have uh, a gro the Growler submarine, which is pretty cool as well. All right. And if there are no more questions, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you guys so much for joining me for our live stream this Friday. Please go to intrepidmuseum.org if you feel inclined to donate and if you want to keep these programs going. Also, if you want to learn about our programming that we have throughout the week, please go to intrepidmuseum.org to find out more information. Other than that, enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy your weekend, ladies and gentlemen. Bye, everyone.